a, there's a discussion I'd like to have with Council regarding access and how we uh, wish to proceed with the regulation of accesses. So quick agenda, um, do a quick recap just to, it's been a while since you spoke about this, um, look at some key changes, and have a particular discussion around access and then we'll do questions and feedback. So in terms of recap, essentially the bylaw, the highways bylaw that we have right now is, is remained pretty much unchanged since incorporation. It's, it's been updated slightly and tweaked, but it's pretty much the same in terms of its, uh, its fundamental structure. Uh, so it's, it's well overdue an update. It's also strategic priority of council. And the last session we had was on the 29th of September last year, where Michael Mercer and I presented the, the, the plan um, in terms of the update. Uh, and as you can see there, in terms of where we're at, um, we're, we're on this second strategy session now, uh, and the next steps will be, you know, to complete the, start, the draft based on any feedback we get tonight, distribute that to, to council and then take it to uh, a regular council meeting for adoption. Or another strategy session if council so wish. Ooh, we've got some ticks and things popping up there, there we go. Uh, so in terms of key changes, um, First one there really is to, to provide clear delineation as to where the highways bylaw regulates. There's a little bit of, a, bit of ambiguity in there right now, uh, and in particular with the, um, the parks and public spaces bylaw, um, which Sean's working on as well as a, as, a, as a subsequent update. So working together to make sure that there's clear delineation as to what, where the jurisdiction of the highways bylaw is and where the jurisdiction of the, the parks and public spaces bylaw is, because there is some contradictory terms where they're both kind of saying different things about different spaces right now. So that needs to be cleared up. That's a big one for us. And um, the next one is the consolidation of the other various kind of bylaws and policies that deal with something within the highway. So I think it makes sense to have one highway by uh, bylaw that incorporates all of, of the aspects, not, not, not have a, another separate bylaw that deals with this particular aspect of regulating something in the highway and this policy that looks at another aspect. Let's all have it in one document. So if there's anything that goes on in the highway, you go in the highways bylaw and it tells you everything you need to know. It's like a one-stop shop, if you like. So some of those are the access bylaw, which we're going to talk about, the access bylaw grade policy, the encroachment bylaw, and of course that incorporates the new crossing agreement procedure that we've recently adopted as well. So that will all be uh, contained within the highways bylaw. Obviously, parking is, is, a, is an issue, and we, we, we hear about that, so it's a frequent topic. So we're still re refining that section and working with bylaw and the Public Works Department to, to remove basically the ambiguity and make enforcement easier. Again, when I went through there, I think there's 35 or 37 different requirements or specifications for parking. And then when you read them, again, because there's so many, there's a lot of contradiction in there. And I think it needs to be a lot clearer. And once it's a lot clearer, it means that our enforcement could be a lot clearer as well. And the, ticket, the ticketing can actually match those particular specifications. So. There's still some work to be done in there. And one particular idea I did have, and um, we're still working on the kind of legalities of that and, and the administration of it is, right now the bylaw says all these things that you can't do in terms of where you can't park. Well, what happens if we just say, this is, what you, this is where you can park? Then by default, everything else you can't do. Maybe that's a simpler way of doing it, I don't know. But there's still some, there's still some issues with that strategy as well. Nothing's perfect. And, uh, once I've kind of got that formulated a bit more, we'll come back with some more information on that. But it's, some, it's definitely a, a key area for us to be focusing on. Uh, the next area is to, to consolidate all permits that regulate and authorise certain activities that take place in the highways. Like right now, we've got um, various permits that, that lie in, in various different locations. And again, bring them all under the, the, uh, or under the guise of the highways bylaw and call them all road uses permits. So we'll have a road uses permit, for example, for constructing the right of way. We have a road uses permit for extraordinary traffic, for hoarding, for vending, for encroachments for access. But they're all road uses permits. They're all permits to do something in the highway. And they're just various, various um, iterations of that same permit. And again, hopefully that will make things cleaner when you come to do something. All the permit uh, requirements are in one place and you can understand what permits you require if you're going to do multiple activities that need multiple permits rather than, there's nothing more furating than coming back and saying, okay, you need a, a, a constructing a right way permit, and the details are over here. And then, well, actually, now, now you're triggering this permit, so you need to go and look at that bylaw or that policy and, and get that permit as well. It makes sense to consolidate them all and have them in one, one place, hopefully. 
and if nothing else, make the make the highways bylaw a bit more of a user friendly document. The next one there, update uh, offences and ticketing. That, that, I think that stands to reason. Update all references to other authorities, regulations, and organisations. That's a big one. You know, they, we're essentially dealing with the same bylaw since '95. Lots of things, departments have changed, terminologies changed, regulations changed as well. So all those need updating as well. And finally, there's the access piece. Now I've already said that I want to consolidate the access regulation into the access, sorry, the highways bylaw. Um, but actually, how we regulate access is the discussion that I'd like to kind of dive a little bit deeper into tonight with council as well. There's the key changes. Uh, and in terms of the access and driver regulation. So again, the access bylaw has been around since incorporation. There's been three iterations and they've been tweaked, you know, minor tweaks, I would suggest, um, through the different years. And the current version was, was completed in 2007. Uh, and we also have a, an access grade policy that was brought in to, to, to provide a little bit more clearer, um, I guess, specifications when it comes to dealing with when do we, what happens if you can't actually meet the access bylaw? You know, because the, 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 and we'll get into that in a minute, the specifications are actually quite hard to meet, especially in Lake Country when the topography is so challenging and varied. It's hard to say that all driveways will meet this standard. Um, obviously, putting an, an access off Bottomwood Lake Road is completely different. So then, you know, trying to put a put an access, um, you know, somewhere up on Tyndall or, um, you know, somewhere with the, the uh, Mobley, somewhere like that, for example. Um, uh, Council Gamble had a question, or do you want? Well, to I don't know if it's coming up, but I wanted to ask it. For a number of years here in the district we have prohibited shared driveway access to properties um, because there were a few disagreements. But I am wondering if that is the responsible way to act in the future because I believe that, you know, removing a lot of trees and making big cuts to give everybody their own access may not be in the best interest of the community. Uh, so I, I raise that because I am concerned about it. Well, I, I do think that we may, there may be situations where it makes more sense, and, and maybe that has to be a variance, but I do think that we have to have maybe a bit of an open mind, and I, I don't know all the details, you're the engineer, but, but I raise it just because I'm thinking, I see you know these huge cuts sometimes, and I think, you know, if two or three people shared a driveway, um, you know, it may work out better. Now, I know there are issues. I know there are, but it's a balance, right? And I do think that might fit in some situations. So three worship. So currently the bylaw says that um, you can have a shared driveway, but they are discouraged because yeah. I get, you know, the issues that you're alluding to there. Councilor You're Campbell. not allowed, are you? No, you, you can in certain circumstances, oh. but, but they are generally discouraged because there are a whole host of issues with shared, shared driveways. Oh. Um, so the you know the current plan really is to, is to bring everything that's from the old access bylaw and bring it across, apart from a few things which we'll get on to um, now. But um, yeah, I mean it's it's not out it's not out of the question, but it is situation dependent for sure. Okay. Yeah, and. And, if, and most of the time where there's a shared driveway and it, it, there's a number of um, properties, we would prefer that that would be that that would be almost serve as a frontage road and dedicated because then it never gets maintained. It gets snow clearance, all the rest yeah. of the things, the liability is taken care of, you know, whereas you, when you, you get a, a group of private owners that have to agree to maintain something to a certain standard and it, it gets problematic. It really does. A, a, just one, one, of, one of the reasons that we we brought that in was because there were three or four, three or four, well, yeah, well, disputes on existing ones that had been built before we mm -hmm. incorporated, but yeah. there was a, that uh, hillside that burned up that went up to Nightwalk. Um, there were three or four people that had bought lots that are 100 feet or 50 feet wide and and 500 feet long 
and they wanted to share a driveway and switch back it up to where they could build on the hillside. Well, who's going to look after it and how is it going to be? We, we no, can't have a shared driveway. So that's why it's there. Yeah. And it, until, I mean, they could have all bought it and come in with some kind of development and build a public road or something, but that, that wasn't going to happen on that hillside. So uh, I, I, I think we shouldn't go away from prohibiting until we yeah. we ha have a lot of those. Uh, but I, I agree, mm -hmm. the, the fewer trees that are taken down to, mm -hmm. to share it, and it might work in some yeah. areas. Mm -hmm. but, Situation. Yeah. So yeah. we can. Like I said, the the option is there. I mean, I I haven't authorised one in my tenure. Yeah. Uh, but it but it's it is it is built into the bylaw currently. Yeah. yeah. Good. Um, where were we? Okay, so um, a little bit of background on this. So, so the first task that uh, I undertook when I was reviewing the access bylaw was to establish the legal authority. Where did our authority come from to establish? Um, the regulation of, of private accesses. Um, and doing so, I, I quickly determined that we're actually stepping outside of our legal authority in some areas with our current access bylaw, um, which obviously needs rectifying. Um, it's, 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 it's not a position that we want to be, to, to be in, uh, in terms of liability and, you know, um, being non-compliant with uh, provincial uh, regulation. But at the same time, it also provided an opportunity to make some uh, additional improvements around process and specifications and, and revise the whole access kind of philosophy, if you like. So we did that through collaboration with the fire department, the building department, the engineering department, and also our legal counsel as well. So it's been uh, quite a bit of work to, to get to where we are. So I've got a, a picture. Uh, oh. Sorry, just a quick, um, I mean, I trust that this is, a shared project with planning so that we're all in the same place so that we don't end up with the one that I talk about all the time across from the boat launch where there are driveways on the road and they park all their cars on the road and they're also an Airbnb, a legal one. So all their guests park on the road because nobody can park on their driveway and now they park their boat on the road as well, yeah. but they keep it hitched to their car. So it's kind of semi legal. But that driveway should have never been built and it's on our road. And roads when roads got the information, which because I gave it to them before that got built, planning had already approved the driveway. So I'm just hoping I'm sure you are back. Yeah, I mean that for your worship that you know that is one of the opportunities that I just mentioned there in terms of process and specifications is is understanding where the authority is and where that authority mm -hmm. should lie. And then how that process is managed to make to ensure that uh, you know there are no gaps, should we say? Um, so I have hopefully the um, the animation will work on this, but uh, I, was I was trying to do it in words, and it was too complicated to try and explain it. So I thought I'd try and do it through pictures. So hopefully my uh, PowerPoint skills don't fa fail me here. So essentially, when you look at the the driveway stroke access regulation, and I. I group them into two two different categories because there's obviously the highway, which is public property, and then there's the private property, you know, and you can see the property line delineating the two there. So what we're really saying is that someone's got to get off the highway, which is public property, and get onto private property. And that's the access. That's the access point piece, getting on and off public highway. And then there's the driveway, which is obviously on private property, which gets you to your wherever it is, your home or whatever structure you have on your, your house. So when you look at the regulatory authority, so the regulatory authority for the highway, the public property section is the highways bylaw. And the regulatory authority authorities <laughs> for driveways are the BC Building Act, which has this piece, which we'll discuss a little bit further, called unrestricted matter for, un, for, for fire access. And we'll come on to that. And then the, the the unrestricted matter basically allows um, local governments to enact further regulation under the BC Building Code for those particular elements for catering for fire department vehicles. So that's the Building Act under under BC Building Code. So that, that's basically optional criteria, if you like, that a municipality, municipality can enact if they wish. 
And then there's a BC building code, which deals with fire access routes. And then when you look at fire access routes, there's, there's two parts to the BC building code that apply here, part nine and part three. Part nine is single family dwellings and um, primarily, and part three is, is commercial primarily. And part three actually has quite strict requirements, which mirror the unrestricted matter criteria. So part three will actually specify width, center line radius, overhead clearance for commercial. But when it comes to part nine single family, they're optional for municipalities to adopt if they want to. So we've established there's two authorities now. There's also a third, our access bylaw also regulates uh, driveways through access permits. So as you can see, there's three competing authorities right now all looking at the same thing. And as you can imagine, there is some inconsistencies. And as I mentioned earlier, there's actually some criteria in our access bylaw that is um, incongruent with Building Act and Building Code. And then when we talk about um, the BC Building Code, I'm just going to read this because I don't want to get this wrong. So BC Building, building Code regulates building structures on private property, which includes the driveway. The Building Act states that the local governments do not have the authority to amend the requirements of the Building Code unless provin the province grants local government what they call concurrent authority. You have to apply for that. So the, the intention of that, I think it was 2009 it came in, I, I believe, I'm speaking to the Chief Building Inspector, was that there were a number of municipalities that would have the BC Building Code, the provincial legislation, and then they would, they would enforce their own local BC Building Code. So when you move from one municipality to another, there was a, a real mishmash of standards. So the Building Act then came back and said, right, we're not doing that anymore. We're, there's going to be one regulatory authority and it's us. Um, however, we will give you this unrestricted matter piece, for, and there's there's one there for fire access, which is what we're looking at right now. So you can actually apply to the, um, the province and say, we would like to in, enforce some additional requirements that aren't in the building code, and that's what you have to go and apply for concurrent activity, um, which is, um, I'm informed, is quite a process to do so, and um, not always successful. So there's that piece to this. Um, and as I've already mentioned as well, that we, we do have some inconsistencies with our access bylaw that aren't congruent with BC Building Code. Um, and we haven't applied for and, and been given concurrent authority either for those elements. So clearly they, they need to be addressed. Just making sure I'm not missing anything. So, so in terms of kind of the proposed way forward, it looks like this, which is rescind or dissolve the access bylaw because the access requirements are going to come into the highways bylaw and then remove the app move the access permit requirements to be regulated under the highways bylaw so now the access permit is dealing with um, the access point but under under the um, unrestricted matter we are allowed to regulate certain parts of the driveway with in certain parameters. So we are currently in the access bylaw, we already regulate the first six meters of a private driveway because what we're trying to create here is, is a, is a level-ish platform. So when you come down your driveway, there's an area where you can stop and stage and make sure it's clear before you then proceed onto the highway or across the sidewalk or whatever it is. Um, you'll see a lot of driveways where literally the edge of the driveway is right on the edge of the road. So right. yeah, exactly. So, you know, when it, when in winter, obviously that's challenging for people, you know, losing traction and sliding into the road, or when there's a rain event and the driveway washes across into the road, you know, there's a whole bunch of safety reasons and operational reasons why we like to have that first six meters as flat as possible. But the way it's written in the current access bylaw is actually, again, inconcurrent with the BC Building Code, but there is, we can change that language and we can still regulate that. So the proposal is to still regulate the access point, but also include the first six meters in the access permit which is pretty much what's currently done anyway. And then we get onto the driveway that's outside the first six meters. So building permits, as already said, you know, deal with the structures and driveway. So the proposal, you didn't see that there, was that you know, the Building Act, the Building Code, obviously um, is, our, is our authority to issue building permits and regulate 
the structural activity on private property. So they're already in the building permit. So what we have now is we have this unrestricted matters piece, which are these guide. Well, I put them there as guidelines. We could actually enforce unrestricted matters as specifications. So there could be requirements where you must. My suggestion is we put them as guidelines because to try and, and this is from experience from our current access by law, to try and say that every access or every driveway in Lake Country needs to be of this maximum grade, needs to be this, needs to be this, needs to be this, needs to be this, is very challenging. And this is why we ended up with a policy where we put restricted covenants and special conditions on certain accesses. Um, and through legal counsel as well, we discuss, you know, what's our liability for ensuring that the fire vehicle, the fire act, the fire truck can get to that property. Um, and by having these as guidelines, it satisfies that need. And there's because there is incumbent responsibility on the property owner to make sure that his or her access is suitable for the vehicle. So by providing the property owner with the specifications as guidelines, say that this is what this is the fire truck specifications this is what you need to design and build to in order to maximize let's say you're up the the um the possibility of the fur truck getting to your property then we've met that that requirement and then when we move to the access permit as i said before it deals with the access point which is primarily looking at public safety so you're looking at the width of the access point, the location of it, sight lines, drainage, quantity, I, how many accesses do you have? Certain properties under the current access bylaw are allowed more than one. Um, single family residents on a local road are allowed two if they're 18 metres apart. Um, commercial operations, especially farming, are allowed um, up to three, I think, I believe it is, if they meet this criteria. Um, and then obviously the first six metres of the private driveway is, is, again, what we're suggesting is contained within the access permit because, and the reason why that is, or another reason why that is, is because if you tie the first six metres to the building permit, not every access is, is being triggered by a structure. So if you've got agricultural, for example, they need access. Well, there's no building permit being triggered there. So how do you regulate that first six metres? Where is the building permit? Just how does that six meters work in the opposite way? Is there when the house is down? Yeah, so it's basically a it's um right now I think it's um two percent. So it's two percent plus or minus. Two percent plus or minus yeah. six yeah. Where is the six meters Yes, there is, yeah. yeah. And again, just Sorry. that's fine. And it and it, really trying to establish that level platform yeah. so you can get on and off safely. Yeah. And you'll notice there as well that it's tied to property line and not edge of road. So your 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 yeah. access is tied to your property line, not where it meets the road. Yeah, which is again a, a, um, a historic issue for us. So, in terms of the, the current triggers for access permits, so we have this um, application checklist right now and you can see that I've highlighted access permits are triggered by all these things and this is problematic for our administration staff as well because it isn't necessarily true all of the time so it still always begs the question well does this really need an access permit they're just doing this or they're just doing that so again the recommendation is is that we and here you can see there's the, there's the list of items so if you get if you're building a retaining wall you need an access permit we have to apply for one um, if you Put a construction trailer in, you might you need an access permit, um, and all these things, and some are some are valid and, and some aren't, and and really the answer is whether you need an access permit. Is it it depends on the situation. There's a whole bunch of factors you have to consider. It's not just black and white that every retainer will need an access permit. But of course, when it's in a checklist and somebody comes at the counter and an administrator staff says, "Oh, what are you doing? Retaining will Oh, it says here you need an access permit. It it causes problems. So the suggestion with this one is we. We do away with that list. Um, and we've simply said the access points, uh, so the access permit, are regulated um, when a new driveway is required, when the existing driveway is being constructed or mod uh, modified, or when there's another permit that may, that may, that may trigger. And, and that, that is a bit vague but because there's a whole bunch of other permits. For example, we just talked about constructing a right-of-way permit. It might be some temporary use of something that's going on that may need temporary access. So 
Um, that's why it says um, it says it may be triggered by another building permit or another sorry, a building permit or another permit. And in terms of the driveway that's regulated by building permits, as we've already established, um, they're, they're again they're triggered when construction of private property requires a new driveway or an existing driveway needs to be modified. And then I think by keeping it nice and clean and simple like that, you've captured pretty much all those requirements. So to summarize the recommendations in terms of regulating access moving forward would be to dissolve, dissolve the existing access by on policy, incorporate the access point regulation and the first six meters. Uh, in, well, sorry, no, incorporate the access point regulation into the highways bylaw and then the permitting under the access permit. The first six metres change of grain to be adopted as a, as a requirement, though, and that would have to be under the building bylaw, or we suggest it's under the building bylaw, because that's where the authority comes from. The access permits to regulate the access point on the highway and the first six metres of private driveway, as I already mentioned. And then the unrestricted matter be adopted as guidelines in the building department policy. So they they become, you know, design criteria, if you like. And then adjust administrative processes to accommodate the changes. But again, Although the current access bylaw is administered primarily by the engineering department and this planned kind of change is now putting more emphasis back onto the building department because that's where the authority lies, which has to happen to a certain degree because we're outside of our authority. The administrative process a bit is, is to make sure that the engineering department is still engaged. In terms of you know the, the technical specifications and the the, the, the checking to make sure that uh, things are being built or being designed to our mm -hmm. guidelines which we've now established and just a quick word on the guidelines the unrestricted matter guidelines so we sat down with the fire chief said okay typical vehicle what would that be give me all the, give us all the specs got the, the senior engineer and text to, to 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 run that model up a driveway and that's how we created those specifications so we now know if you build your driveway to these specifications that um Engine 71 can make it up that driveway as long as it's maintained and and kept yeah. clear and free of obstacles and, and the rest of like which is which is the homeowner's responsibility. So I have a question. I don't know if it fits into this highway policy, but um, when some of our subdivisions have come forward, um, and I'm thinking particularly of one that came forward a couple of years ago on Pretty Road. Uh, and rather than having access points onto, I think it's Middleton Road South, they call that now. No, we didn't want to do that as council. So as a result, we've got about six accesses coming right out onto Pretty Road. Years ago, of course, they all did that. But I thought we were getting a little bit more mature in our community. Maybe we... <laughs> Maybe we could do it differently and use some planning tools yeah. and, you know, try and keep all those access points off that collector road. It's becoming a collector road. I mean, maybe it's minor, but nevertheless, now we've got people pretty upset about it because, you know, it's dangerous. Um, is that does that fall within here? Because those are access points. Yeah, so there's there's integration with. Um, the highways bylaw in terms of providing access and then the, the development approvals process as well. So in terms of, of access points, the engineering department would still regulate the access points. And obviously there's still the SDS process to go through and there's still the, the development review process that needs to be gone through as well, which the engineering department are heavily involved with as well. So, so access is very much considered from, from the concept stage all the way through to delivery. And I, I, I can't speak about the historic events that, that, that led to that situation. But generally, my philosophy is one civic address, one access. So if if there's a strata development, you'd get one access. But if there's but multifamily development, you'd get one access. But but what do you access onto? And that's the, the critical point. Yeah. Because, um, I mean, my whole, as the area grows, and it is going to, you know, we have to think ahead about where we're going to permit those accesses. Yeah. Otherwise, we're just going to create more and more bottlenecks. Yeah. And so I don't know if 
that is something that should be in here, but I'm just I'm just asking the question now. Yeah, so in terms of the the access points, certainly is, and it, it's already integrated into that process. Okay. Yeah, for sure. Um, the difficulty comes in in when, and this is why the bylaws written in such a way right now that it says, and you recall this through the um, recent uh, Woodsdale gas bar, is that yep. when a DP comes forward with a site plan, then it really should have an access permit attached to it, because that site plan is is um, is stipulating where the access wants to be. So if, if council come forward with the site plan and the DP and say, yeah, we're good with that, let's approve that. And then, but they haven't got an access permit, and we look at the aspect of well, that doesn't work there. Then we're coming, then we're, we're coming full circle again and coming back, and you know, that's why the process is such that um, in it states right now, and, and we'll, it will retain that, uh, remain that way, is that any DP or BP should have an access permit associated with it, and they and they should run in conjunction because you can't design a site without considering your accesses, and you can't consider your accesses without designing your site. So the two have to be done hand in hand. Yeah, and I see public safety is your number one point. Always. So. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And the, the uh, road that Councillor Gamble's talking about, um, that's kind of one of those subdivisions that got away on us, because we understood when we looked at it and we were given the drawing and we were talking about it, that the access point was gonna be off of the internal road. And that's where we left it. No one and we we certainly didn't envision that they would access off a of pretty road, which became what they did. Obviously, it uh, allowed him to build more houses than he planned to build. But um, it's one of those council things that once it gets past us, there's nothing you can do about it. So we we've, we've got to try to lock those kind of things down because it, it does create a mess and it's not a good situation on that road for sure. Yeah, and I think um, you know with some kind of recent improvements we've made with our, our process as well. There's a lot more rigor being applied to to understanding, you know, what essentially is a concept plan, but also is kind of setting the path for the way that this development will occur anyway, and being really clear as to what it is we're approving or we're, is being brought forward to council for approving, and being clear what, what what's in and what's out. Um, and a bit of a, you know, I guess a sidebar to that is that, you know, Understanding where did the, did the authority for a DP lies as well. You know, what does a DP allow you to do and what do, what does it not allow you to do? Knowing that there's other approval processes that need to happen in order for you to be able to construct things. Um, so, so, so just I guess just to summarise, I, I do believe that you know the changes that we're proposing are a step in the right direction. We've already made some progress in terms of tightening that up, um, and I, th I think this just you know builds on that 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 development. Karen. Thank you. Um, thanks for the presentation. Um, I've just got a couple of questions, um, and this is because I don't know the bylaw well enough. Um, things like sight lines, where does that sit? Does that sit in the highways? Okay. Um, and then if, for example, the usage changed, so the access permit is based on one type of use, and then the usage at that property changes, how does that get captured in terms of it might be okay for X, but not for Y kind of thing. How does that, how does that change of development within, once the process has gone through, how does that get captured? So three ways. So, so in terms of change of use, it would very much depend on what the use is and if there's a regulatory component that would then bounce it back through district processes. So say it was based on a traffic study that had X traffic going through yep. and then down the line business plans change mm -hmm. and now the volume of traffic is considerably larger, then does that change the access point or is there enough robustness in the original specification to accommodate volume traffic changes or types of traffic changes? So say it might be for construction traffic and now it's residential traffic, for example. Yeah, and it's clearly very difficult to um, relocate an access once it's been given. So, but there are there are improvements that could be made to an existing access if if the situation had changed mm -hmm. and warranted you know, that access being revisited. And there is there are there is enough 
Um, latitude, I guess, in the clauses built into the access permit that say that this is valid for this. Okay. And if anything changes, then yep. it's not valid anymore and you have to go through the process again. Great. That was what I was looking So, So yeah. when you issue an access, then they're not forever. Okay. They're but on a specific they're, use. Yeah, they are forever if, if nothing it changes. changes. Right. Okay. Yeah. Super. Um, the, uh, the suggestions around the guideline for unfettered access, unrestricted access, um, do we have any kind of existing case law that that would actually not open us to liability? Because I can see a situation where the house is built and the developer makes the decision to do what they can, but maybe not take all of the specification to heart because of cost or topography or something. Then they sell the house. Then the new owner, something happens, unfortunately, fire. Engine can't get up there. Yeah. Um, new owner and new owner's insurance company come to the district and go, well, you didn't ensure that that was built to the standard. Therefore, it's the district's fault. Yeah. How how protected are we <laughs> on that side of it? So, through, so that was a lengthy discussion with the, the, the legal counsel okay. as, as, to, as to where we land on this and where our liability is. Um, and it was quite interesting, actually, because they went and looked at historic cases and they said the only instance they can find of a fire department being found to be or district found to be I mean, found to be negligent for a, a, a fire department vehicle not being able to respond. There's one case, I think, in, I don't know, somewhere um, Nova Scotia way where the fire department were training and uh, they were they were training on our house and they were going to burn it down and they burnt the wrong house down. Um, and that's the only instance that he could find <laughs> yeah, of, um, of a fire department ever being found negligent of not responding and not fulfilling their duties. Okay. Um, and I think, and I think the re one of the, the fundamental reasons is, is because even if you were really prescriptive and said you must build your driveway to these specifications and for some unforeseen mm -hmm. reason the fire truck still couldn't get mm -hmm. there are we still liable mm -hmm. or they didn't clear the snow properly or there was a you know whatever it may yeah. be so i think not i think but the the word we got back from um the legal counsel was in order to remain some maintain flexibility in in allowing for the the challenge of topography that they have not knowing that a set standard mm -hmm. would apply to everyone it'd be almost impossible right was that you know if their guidelines you can advise um apart from the building pro permit process that this is mm -hmm. what we recommend and the reason why it's good to have the flexibility as well is because the the bc building code already has a whole bunch of flexibility built in okay for part nine single family dwellings in terms of um driveway access predominantly around fire departments so for example building inspectors say well do you know what there's there's these um, circumstances which I'm not comfortable with for what various reasons. So I'm going to require you to sprinkle your house. Right. Or you're going to have to build your house out of completely non-retardant fire, um, completely fire retardant materials. And that discretion is already there. there okay. there's, there's a whole bunch of discretion. So if we then take those unrestricted matters and make the specifications, we're now really at odds, I would suggest, with the, the, the mm. building code because there's all this discretionary power already. And now we're saying, but you must do this. Gotcha. So you might end up with a bit of a conflict there. So I think, again, just on the balance of it, I think it's probably the best approach to have them as uh, guidelines, mm -hmm. make everyone aware of them. Mm -hmm. We can check to see whether they've been met or not. Mm -hmm. And if they've not, well, the engineering department will still do that. We highlight that to the building department and have a discussion. Okay, well, what does that mean then? What, how else, if they can't meet the requirements or the guidelines, what's the risk associated with that? And are there any other discretionary measures mm -hmm. that we can request to reduce that risk further. Okay. So I, I think that's how it will best be managed. Right. I mean, nothing's ever 100%. Yeah. But uh, like I said, we spent a lot of time and effort on this. I think we're probably at the, um, at, the, at the best outcome. My last question is, can we go back to the slide where you were suggesting the amendments to the, that? That's the one, the one there. Um, so when it says regulated, um, constructed or modified, what does modified mean like resurfacing or changing the shape or how is that how is what does modified mean in terms of it's a broad term it's a very broad term yeah and I, and the reason why it's broad is because there's some discretion there 
but how does that, how does that, I'm speaking from a community side, it's coming in and saying, okay, I've got, Sean's got a honey list, my husband, and I need him to re-blacktop our driveway. So existing driveway, no changes, just resurfacing, filling in cracks and all that kind of jazz. Yep. Does that need an access, access permit? Depends. On what? <laughs> Because that's not good. I, I don't yeah, know, I know where I am now. Am yeah. I going to the district or am I phoning a contractor and telling him to come and black top? So, so primarily it will be triggered by existing processes. So if somebody comes in and says, you know, I need a, one of various permits to do what I'm planning to do, we would then look at that permit and go, well, is this, is this affecting the, the access permit that was issued? Does, is the access permit that was issued still valid? Or is now this being, has this now, or the proposed work now changing that access permit? But how do I know to even come in? At the moment, I'm just there going, I'm just finding a contract and telling him to black top my driveway because I'm not changing it in any way. So Yeah, but but that, I, I guess that's the same conundrum that a lot of people face where I didn't know we needed a permit for that. Yeah. So I, I think in, in this instance, we would rely on, like we do mostly, on two things. One, um, People coming in for permits right and then obviously that permit request gets assessed and and is this fundamentally changing the access or not hmm. um, and the second one is um, by reports that we get so whether that's somebody reporting somebody else for doing <laughs> something or our um, our public works crew out, out and about noticing that something is being done that, that should require a permit. But then that puts that makes it very costly for the person in the community who's just paid to have their blacktop redone, and then the district come along, their works crew see it and say, "Well, oh, I should have had a permit for that." Wake it all up again and redo it, and that's not fair because it's not clear. I'm going to posit what modified means yeah. to the community. So I think you know, in this instance, we could just rely basically back to the access permit and say. The access permit that you've been issued that's got the drawing attached to it and the specifications right. has right. that changed okay and if it's not changing it's just replacing what's already there they're good and this will have some communication yeah. to the community around it because driveways are pretty like that they get a they get changed and yeah. resurfaced so i think we do need a, a communication aspect of this yeah. to make it absolutely clear what these changes mean if we're not getting it triggered by all of those anymore. Yeah. Okay. I agree. And okay. and you know just to, to to reiterate that point as well is that the reason why I haven't listed every other permit on there is because there, there's quite a few that could trigger right. uh, a driveway modification, for example. Like you know that that list of road uses permits that I mentioned there, any one of those could trigger an access permit. A building permit could trigger an access permit. A DP could trigger an access permit. So you know it's just incumbent on us to make sure that when those permits come across the table that we've got access in mind and it's being considered. And how much does it cost to get an access permit? Fifty dollars. Fifty dollars. That's <clears throat> thank you. Benny. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. And uh, I I totally agree with what um uh Councillor Reed is saying. And I I you know I, I really thought that you know what we've done with the planning department where we've kind of got where there's this effort to get more clarity. I like your idea of simplifying because I think, yeah, that's really important. But at the same time, there has to be some clarity of when it triggers. Otherwise you wouldn't know. I wouldn't have any idea mm -hmm. when I would need to get a permit, unless it's a brand new permit, you know, which that's is obvious that you need one. And I, I wondered if, you know, there should just be some like triggers for an access point. You, you raise them. Things like public safety, width and location, sight lines, drainage, uh, quantity. I don't know what that means. <coughs> number of accesses. Pardon? Number Different. of accesses. Number. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Number. Uh, and uh, and then within the first six meters uh, of the private driveway. Yeah. I mean, that would give some clarity to what it means. Um, that's all. Because the average person out there wouldn't have a clue what those requirements would yeah. be. And say that, you know, they want to... You know, company comes in and says, "Okay, we're gonna we're gonna you know blacktop your driveway for five thousand dollars." Yeah, not likely, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, you know, maybe a little trigger a drainage issue. You know, yeah. you don't know those things, yeah. and then all of a sudden, oh, you needed a permit, you didn't get it. You know, so I guess that's all. We need some clarity so people have an idea 
um, what, when to get that sort of thing. So three words, just just quick on that. So that clarification typically wouldn't, wouldn't happen in the bylaw, but on the access permit right now, um, I, I do believe there is a, a clause in there that says, you know, that this permit is valid for for the design that you have um, submitted and, and, and has been approved. And if you make any changes, you need to notify the district. So we can we can highlight that for sure, you know, and and provide maybe some more context as to what does that mean, you know. So, yeah. You know, and uh, to, to 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 try and I guess hone people's understanding of, of what a modification yeah. would be, you know, because they That's may say, exactly well, you know, right. I know, I've read this and it did say if I've changed it, but I don't think I've really changed it, you know. So I we can put some criteria in there for sure that clarifies that, so people are, are, are hopefully more understanding of what we're going to have to what will trigger this. modification. Uh, yeah. We've got the council okay. meeting then. Okay. okay. Uh, Todd, did you have any comment or question? Uh, yes. Yes. Any juice <laughs> left? Carry on. Um, so um, a couple couple things. So if I'm understanding this correctly, um, just because we've given a permit, we make a mistake or somebody makes a mistake and you end up with an issue like across the boat launch in, o in Okanagan Centre, can we not address that then? Can we not fix that? Because I seen somebody drive over it the other day again and it, uh, sooner or later somebody's getting hurt there. So I just, if everything is, uh, you know, top priority is uh, safety, that's a big safety issue for me. So, you know, if, if that's going to be your criteria, we definitely need to address that one for sure. There's there's definitely some others in the community as well. And, uh, you know, as far as uh, safety goes, pretty road, you know, obviously their residents are pretty upset with that one. You know, you go down to the bottom end of that to where that um, Turtle Bay crossing should have come out and you got a building right on the corner there that you can't see by and then they put up them stupid sandwich boards there now you can't see again so uh, we're just setting ourselves up for um some accidents here and and likely a fatality at some point because we allow some of this stuff so not not impressed on my end by by any means and uh, if we're going to uh if we're going to um do this right let's really uh, make sure that we can address these issues because uh that's definitely you know yep. safety is um is priority on that one's for sure so um that would be my uh my biggest concerns on this and um you know if we're going to do this let's make sure we do this right okay thank you so uh, I, just quickly on um, yeah. free worship so the intent of, of of the amendment is moving forward how we how we regulate these moving forward if council wishes us to go and 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 address historic issue driveways, then that's certainly something we could we could look at. Um, obviously there are some some challenges doing so, but it, it's not uh, beyond the realms of possibility. So right now the 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 amendments proposed are take care of some of the things that could happen. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's what we want, and we'll address those historic ones subsequently. Okay. Anyway, we'll have to wrap up and get going for our council meeting. So, uh, 